One of those warm, nearly windless days of Indian summer, when people who loved the city told one another, I wouldn't live anywhere else in the world. A very slow day for news. The space shuttle launch was postponed by rainstorms in Florida. A last chance to light up on the airliners, the house banned smoking on domestic flights. Evidence of a rat problem at Sunnyvale Mall made the early addition. Vice President Quayle stopped in San Francisco to help Pete Wilson campaign for governor. On Montgomery Street, another bad day for stocks. The Dow dropped 18 points. Even the dedication of a Marin water plant made the news. But everyone knew on this day that there was but one big story. Game three of the World Series. Oakland fans charted a ferry. And a Giants booster showed his support by swimming eight miles to the game. Some wondered how he kept his ticket dry. Go Giants! At precisely five o'clock, the nation tuned in to Candlestick Park. At home for the Giants, one of the most spectacular vistas on this continent, any continent. Downtown San Francisco in the background, and we zoom into Candlestick Park in the southeastern corner of this city. For the first time in 27 years, a World Series game will be played in Candlestick Park. The Battle of the Bay continues. As I'm Al Michaels. Welcome to Game 3. It's been dominant Oakland pitching, of course, in the first two games. As so Al Michaels and his colleagues in the broadcast booth reviewed the baseball action that had led up to this third game of the World Series. We go back to Game 2. The score was 5-1, to one, but there were two key plays early in that one as well. Hey, well we're having an earth you can see power lines are swaying. Cheryl Jennings in the Channel 7 newsroom. As you may have noticed, our power was knocked out just as some of the pre-game activities for the World Series was getting underway. That game is scheduled to start any moment now. A major earthquake, an earthquake which was felt from Oakland to Sacramento as far south as Los Angeles. We have reports of major power outages in San Francisco and reports throughout the Bay Area. Pete Wilson is out at Candlestick right now. Let's see if we can go to Pete Wilson live to see if there was anything felt out at the stick. Pete? Cheryl, obviously people are terribly nervous here. The power is off in Candlestick Park. This quake hit, as you have uh, told people, just shortly after 5 o'clock. It was very obvious very quickly. The building began to shake. It terrified people. Uh, there was yelling and screaming almost instantaneously. The cars here in the parking lot were rolling back and forth, literally bouncing on the ground as this lasted for several seconds. These folks quieted down very quickly, but there is considerable concern because as we know, a lot of the Giants fans are from the South Bay, and that seems to be the direction of the quake. That's yeah. the biggest one we've ever felt. We were up in 32. We could see the whole upper deck was just going like this, and the expansion joint was just moving like that. The whole tower was undulating, and the catwalk was undulating, and uh, the pole was moving like, I'd say, at least 10 or 12 feet back and forth like that. I don't want to stay in that place anyway. We were I was up in the top row, the last seat, and it was ugly. I've never felt more unsecure in my life, so helpless. But I'm safe and I'm happy. Ladies and gentlemen, we are, we are postponing the game because there is no power in the stadium. There has been a power failure. Therefore, the game will be postponed. We ask that you hold on to your...
your tickets as rain checks will be honored. Thank you. All of a sudden it hit and I was, whoa, where am I? And I'm, I still feel real sick. This year I'm not coming back. It was up to me, I'll leave tonight on a plane to Florida. I saw the, the sky boxes up there and the windows really shaking and, and at about the same time I felt my feet underneath my feet just like a wave. Only those with portable radios or battery TV sets at Candlestick Park were beginning to discover with the rest of the world, the serious dimensions of the quake. We're here at the UC Berkeley Seismology Station where they reported the strong earthquake at exactly 5.04 p.m. They have determined that the epicenter was exactly 10 miles northeast of Santa Cruz, 20 miles south of San Jose, that it is in fact a 7.0 on the Richter scale. Been numerous aftershocks since then. The magnitude of this earthquake brought down a 50-foot section, a cantilever section of the Bay Bridge. Uh, we understand that there have been cars trapped. That is the Cypress section of the Nimitz Freeway. And you can see, oh my God, look at that. Um, the freeway has just completely collapsed. And it looks as though there are vehicles down there. The traffic, of course, is completely stopped. Oh, that's, uh, that's pretty frightening. We have pictures of a fire in Berkeley. I'm told the location is Berkeley. It is a major fire, a large fire nearly half a block long. The fire that has filled the skies over the East Bay is coming from this building here in Berkeley. It is a uh, garage mechanics building where they do a lot of repairing on cars. What happened was when the quake hit, a lot of the solvents and paints that are inside exploded. With me is Berkeley uh, Sergeant Ron Barella. Ron, you were here very early in all of this. What was it like when you first got here? You could very hear it very clearly hear the sounds of the drums inside exploding. Uh, you can see flames coming out from all of the windows. Uh, the flames were going very near to the adjacent buildings. And again, it is just very fortunate, first of all, that nobody was injured. Secondly, they were able to confine the fire to this one building. Five people in San Francisco's South of Market area were not so fortunate. When the earthquake hit, uh, the top two floors of the building, the, the wall gave way and uh, trapped some people in their cars down below that were preparing to leave for uh, home. You see what we have, Chief? Yeah. We've got one fatality right in the middle of that. Five victims were buried under tons of brick. Firefighters and volunteers dug frantically into the rubble, but there were no survivors. Meanwhile, across the bay, other volunteers were having more success with rescue efforts. Dozens of motorists trapped on the collapsed cypress span of the Nimitz Freeway were being helped to safety. The company right across the street had some, uh, some extension ladders. We went over there, clammed the fence, got the ladders, threw them back over the fence, and that's how we uh, got up on top of the freeway because the fire department was not here. Uh, no one was here but us. But before nightfall, the awful toll at the collapsed freeway would begin to come clear. Reporter Leslie Brinkley was driving on the Bay Bridge when the earthquake hit. We were just about several hundred feet in front of uh, the cars that were trapped in that portion behind us, so we came very close to being in the middle of it there. And then all three of us in the vehicle uh, noticed that there were pieces, crumblings coming from the top of the bridge. And one man described it as being in the twilight zone and just not having any, any sense of reality. It was all so bizarre, all so uh, frightening and scary. We had many different descriptions from people as they drove over. It felt like we had a flat tire, but you could see the whole bridge moving. Uh, then the next thing, the traffic, traffic started slowing down. And then we saw um, a man on a bike coming against the traffic, and the traffic was still doing 30 miles an hour. And he was waving and telling everybody to get off the bridge. And then the next second, there was a herd of people running towards us, screaming and shouting, run, run, which was absolutely terrifying. I visualized the bridge caving in, and it kept coming closer and closer to me, but still I knew all I could do was run, and all I could depend on was my legs, so I just kept running and everybody else kept running. I died back on the bridge. I don't know what I'm going to do. I figure at some point something's going to happen where I'll have a chance to do good and I'll say, this is what this was all about. This is why I'm still here. Of all the Bay Bridge images, the most graphic was caught by an Oklahoma tourist, Debbie Kelly. They sent us down here, surprisingly, in the wrong direction. There's another car. Gosh! That could have been us, but we just turned around. Thomas, we need to go down there and help. Um, the 
could see a piece of the bridge was missing, just a hole in front of you. And I, she was going so fast, she may simply not have seen it. She just wanted to get off that bridge as fast as she could. And then so went speeding along. She never hit her brakes even. I don't know if she thought she was going to jump it or just didn't see it. And she flew a full 30 feet in the air to the far side of the bridge and made a sound that is, that is never going to leave my brain. And we flagged down a uh, Coast Guard helicopter and got it to land on the bridge, and the bridge crews came and secured the car so it wasn't going to fall over. You're seeing a car that attempted to drive over this 50-foot gap in the Bay Bridge. It has been like a drama here. It has been dangling from the edge, the precipice behind me, and these folks are just getting rescued right now. It's been a frightening scene here. As you can see just below me is where this crack in the Bay Bridge occurred, a 50-foot section. You see down there below the two cars two cars that were on the upper deck when the bridge collapsed. They fell below. We understand that the people in both of those cars did get out safely. They're still in there. Still trapped in their car, Leisista Halanahu and his sister, Anafahi Kalasa. I noticed uh, uh, a space about uh, three feet before we hit it. That's the last time I know. And I saw my sister she was breathing, uh, her nose, her mouth, her ears, and she was still breathing, and I tried to wake her up, but she never talked to me, she said, hmm, that's it. I was lucky to get to the, to the survive, and I was being blessed. You know. Palanaha was hospitalized with serious but not fatal injuries. His sister was dead on the right. While that life and death drama was played out on the Bay Bridge, an ominous black plume rose over San Francisco. I know there is a fire in what would be uh, the Marina District, or very close to it. It's not far from Fisherman's Wharf. It would be in the, uh, the northern section of the city. It appeared to me uh, maybe a half a mile in from, from San Francisco Bay, and that appears to be the most serious of the fires that uh, I'm able to see at this particular point. We've had serious problems, obviously. Go home and secure your residence. Shut off the gas, shut off electricity, store water, prepare for aftershocks, prepare for three days you got 90 minutes of life left. You better make this your time. Go prepare yourselves. Prepare yourselves. Shut off the gas. Shut off electricity. Store water in your bathtub. Don't expect services for 72 hours. Okay? Prepare yourself for nightfall. You have about one hour of light left. Prepare for aftershocks. Make sure your building is sound enough to go back inside. Okay, we are back live in the Channel 7 newsroom. Right now, Chapin Day was with our assignment desk uh, just back. You were witness to some very frightening situation in San Francisco, Chapin. Tell yes, me about um, it. I was uh, in Mill Valley at the time of the quake, drove back across the bridge. In the Marina District, uh, there is a major fire burning in the area of uh, Divisadero and Jefferson in what is the remains of a number, and I could not tell because of all the smoke. How many? Okay, we have pictures up there now, okay. Chip, and maybe you can walk us through this. I saw several buildings collapse. I mean, apartment buildings of four to five, um, four to five stories, with one or two stories collapsed. The fire is now going quite strong. Fire units are responding. People in the street stunned, walking around. What happened? Where is so and so? People trying to make sense of what's happened. And the marina, which of course is built on the landfill from the old fair in 1915, is now in serious jeopardy. There are large cracks in many, many homes. Mm -hmm. And there are these collapsed buildings as well. Okay, Chapin, thank you very okay. much. Chapin, sure. thank you for that report. Chapin, obviously a little bit shaken. We have a lot of down buildings. We're looking at three-story uh, buildings, such as this one and this one here, that are now one story. I have no idea how many people inside. Considering it being 5.15 at night, I would think that probably a majority of the people on their way home haven't gotten home yet, okay? We are a 96-year-old lady 
next door, whatever your neighbors is. She's up on the third floor in the back. Third floor in the back. Right next door, next door. Here we go, man. Take a blow, bud. Watch the building. It's up for the building. It's up. Oh, I Okay, let's keep everybody back in line. To Laura Marquez, who is standing by to give us a live update. Here I'm at the corner of Jefferson and Divisadero. You can see this building is collapsed. They don't know if people are still in there or if they aren't. You can see the fire down past me. Uh, what has happened is that the natural gas lines have ruptured, and that is what has caused that fire. The water lines have ruptured. There is no water coming out of the fire hydrants. People are running into this building that Randy's now showing you, and they are looking for people. They're asking for people to come by. They're saying that people are still trapped in there. We were down at two, number two Cervantes. Another building like this one had collapsed. I was had two deaths confirmed there. Uh, people are trying to get other people out of them. The marina's really hard hit. There are cracks everywhere. Everywhere you go, you can see these buildings collapse. They're real concerned that they're going to have the fire spreading because they have no water left in any of the fire hydrants. The only water they're using is right off of the fire trucks. The marina area has been hit very badly. We are on a landfill here, as Chapin already mentioned. It's very bad here. Coming into the city, uh, crossing Golden Gate Bridge, you can see the fire in the marina. Up the street where the fire was, it was uh, like a volcano, just roaring up the center of the block. Going out of town, it was bumper to bumper. Uh, the lights are all, all the way down here. And to the south, the jammed corridor between the city and Candlestick Park. Thousands who had vacated the stadium were now stopped dead on the freeways. The major link between San Francisco and the East Bay was gone. There is no traffic. There is no way across the bay right now via the bridge. While we're up here, we can see a number, you know, a lot of lights are on. Electricity has started to come back. But as I look over toward San Francisco at the other end, of the uh, Bay Bridge, you can see San Francisco is in blackness still. None of the uh, lights are on in the downtown area of San Francisco, so obviously a lot of power outages continue in the city. With traffic signals dark through much of the city, hundreds of volunteers had taken to the streets of their own volition to direct traffic. Many would work through the night. San Francisco's two daily newspapers, The Chronicle and The Examiner, were being put together by candle and flashlight. Many phones and computers were dead. The word processor was out. The old manual typewriter was in. We're just going to spike it. We sent a second take with the inserts. Viacom went off the air, and of course we went off the air. We're running on generator power right now. Most of the major radio and television newsrooms were out of operation only briefly, then broadcast through the night on diesel generators. Here in the Channel 7 newsroom, we felt uh, a jolt, and we all shot an earthquake, and then it hit and knocked our, us off the air. It knocked televisions off of the uh, stands here, and all of a sudden, people got very nervous and very scared. Ana Chavez... Was Throughout the Bay Area, hotels had no power, no air conditioning, no operating elevators. Restaurants were without light or refrigeration, so perishable food was on the house. And as soon as emergency power could be fired up, television sets were turned on. With telephone lines jammed, TV sometimes became an improvised means of reassuring concerned relatives. We're okay, Ma. I do, I, Tony. <laughs> this is where they're putting people who have not been able to find hotel space. As you can imagine, uh, they evacuated somewhere between 15 and 25,000 people from this airport after the quake hit. Uh, the hotels are jammed out here around the airport. Some people just can't find any place to sleep or to stay. So they've brought them to the South Terminal. They're sleeping here. The airport continues to be closed. It's a ghost town up here. We're on the departure level. We are finally allowed up here. There are uh, garbage trucks and, and trash hauling trucks that have moved up, and I'm going to show you why. We'll, we're going to take a walk inside the terminal here and show you exactly what happened out here. As you can see, it looks uh, pretty much like a war zone. Ron, if you can pan down here. This is all the uh, drop ceiling in the new international terminal. This all came yeah. down in, in the quake, but as far as structural damage goes, they say they have inspected the airport. They can't find any major structural problems uh, in the buildings. The runways are okay. They've checked those out, but still they've decided that they really can't, they really can't even entertain the notion of flights going in or out. There were people walking down with their luggage and 
Uh, a lot of people were complaining, didn't even know the severity of this whole thing, obviously. They'd just gotten off flights. They were out here waiting to go on flights. Uh, we had to tell them that uh, this was a major earthquake. There were injuries, there had been deaths, there were fires in the city, and, and people were pretty much sitting around outside with their luggage waiting for buses in shock. They don't know when they're going to reopen this airport. There is a lot, a lot to clean up. much worse than uh, we at first thought. We are down in Oakland. We are at the Cypress Street overpass, the ramps that lead from Oakland uh, onto the Bay Bridge, the Nimitz Freeway. It's unbelievable. There are 14 city block sections of this ramp. Uh, the upper ramp collapsed onto the lower ramp, as you can see up there. It's it's something that is beyond belief. There are rush hour cars, rush hour traffic that was trapped on this lower level. You can see the upper level sitting on top of the lower level right now. Those cars, those people still trapped underneath there. Uh, right behind us where you see the fire truck and ladder, a rescue is ongoing right now for a little girl and a little boy who are trapped in a car up there. Very few people have been rescued from here. Police have found some a lot. Uh, some people dead here. They're bringing in heavy equipment. They're bringing in jackhammers. Uh, they're trying to do what they can to begin to lift up sections of this. But as you can see, it's an almost impossible task. It's going to be months, we're told, before this section of the freeway is even close to opening again. And uh, we, we just don't know how long it's going to take to get these other people out. Tell me what you can about the rescue of these kids up there, what you saw up there, what you heard up there. We have three vehicles that are up there. Two of them are totally collapsed. One vehicle, it looks like the driver and another occupant were uh, smashed by the collapse. Two young children were in the back seat. We've been trying to rescue them for the last two hours. We did get one child out about 45 minutes ago. We've been working for the last 45 minutes trying to free the other child. Um, it's, it's real total chaos right now. It's going to take days, if not weeks, just to find whatever survivors and other victims there are in there. It's surrounded by police, it's surrounded by fire officials, surrounded by paramedics. The ambulances are going in and out. As many as 40 people may be dead. There are hundreds of rescue workers, hundreds of volunteers out here tonight trying to get into this tiny crawl space, trying to see if there are survivors here. Just the sheer weight on it, just to be able to even get up there and try to see how many cars there are. Some of them are crushed to six inches high up there, so it's it's just incredible, the, the weight and the destruction that's going on. Even to have someone alive down there is just a miracle. There are voices coming from some of the vehicles on that lower ramp of the freeway. And there are hundreds of volunteers doing what they can to try to locate those voices and try to get in and save as many folks as they possibly can. A rescue is ongoing right now for a little girl and a little boy. The little girl, we understand, is nine years old. Her brother is six years old. They are still trying to get those kids out right now. The girl was brought out to safety, but her brother was pinned beneath the body of their dead mother. Surgeon Jim Betts and a colleague made a difficult decision. The decision was made at that time to actually remove as much of her as we could, knowing that we couldn't totally extricate her. The other surgeon and I decided that the best way to do this would be to literally divide her body, and that's what we did. But the seven-year-old boy was still trapped. Dr. Betts had to amputate a leg to get him out and I literally had to lie on my stomach um, on the corner of the back seat of this car um, to reach down inside to get to his leg. Finally, after two hours of surgery, the small victim was on his way to an Oakland hospital. I think deep in my heart, I felt that if it were my child or, or the family would be able to be there, that they would agree with any decision possible to go ahead and save the life of this boy. We would have liked to have gotten him out of the car earlier. Um, it looks as though he hasn't suffered significant um, untoward effects uh, of being out there for that long, of being cold, of being in shock. By now, the first reports were coming in from Santa Cruz, a city virtually isolated. This town of 40,000 is about uh, 10 miles from the epicenter of the earthquake. You would expect the damage to be severe here, and it is. The downtown section of Santa Cruz is basically gone. All the old uh, brick unreinforced buildings have collapsed. This is a department store called Ford's. It collapsed 
The second store, a uh, second story, came down into the into the first floor, trapping several people inside. At least three people are known to have died here on the mall. Perhaps uh, 12 to 14 total in Santa Cruz. Authorities do not have a, a final fatality figure. Many, many other people are injured. I was down at the other end of the mall, Ford's department store, and the windows blew out, and I heard the ceiling come in, and that's uh, right away. I just went up the mall and uh, realized it's pretty much the whole mall had come down, and. Uh, there was a woman screaming inside the, the Ford's department store. About 10 of us jumped in right away. And, uh, since then, we've been up and down the wall trying to find anybody else. Have they found other people? As far as I know, they found another man here, and they, they think there's a woman in there because they heard her, her uh, crying for help. So they're, they're trying to find out. They had rescue crews in there uh, going brick by brick, but uh, the tremors kept bringing everybody back out. Uh, you felt that too, right? Here we go again. Uh, everyone looked really shook up, and then, uh, then just a lot of people seemed more relaxed uh, half an hour later. And I see the fire crews come, came running out right after that little tremble too. This this whole building is ready to come down. You can see the whole corner, the whole corner is just uh, bricks keep shifting and stuff. I guess what happened? They heard a woman's voice for a while, and uh, things shifted like 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 now, and things started dropping, and they haven't heard her since. A couple of trees came down on cars, uh, but mostly I think every window in the mall was blown out water pipes were shooting, uh, it smelled like gas, every gas line was broken. People are camped out on their front lawns and will be sleeping on their lawns tonight as aftershock after aftershock continues to roll through this area. At one large retirement home, people in wheelchairs and crutches are sleeping in the parking lot rather than stay inside their old home. The problem here is unreinforced buildings. The second and third floors of these buildings have been vacant for some time because of the fears of earthquake damage. When the earthquake did hit, it was the people who were inside on the first floor who bore the brunt of that damage. Uh, Santa Cruz, Watsonville, uh, the areas further south are all getting this sort of damage in these older buildings. Uh, Santa Cruz itself is virtually isolated. It took me uh, five hours to get here tonight on a drive that is normally three hours. Most of the roads in or out of Santa Cruz are blocked by boulders falling on the highways and giant redwood trees closing the highways. Meanwhile, in San Francisco's Marina District, Laura Marquez was reporting on fear spreading before the flames. Well, you can see this block of Divisadero is practically entirely on fire. The house on the right is the first one that went, and it went because of a natural gas main busting. The house across the street is also going up in flames. They are afraid that this fire is going to spread because there is no water in any of the fire hydrants. The fire departments are coming up across from the Marina Green and they are pulling up hoses. A lot of the residents from the Marina are trying to help them pull the hoses. They're having to take them at least four blocks up in order to get this fire out. Cut! Cut! a couple of deaths. They believe at least a couple of deaths. There has not been any confirmed, but they do know that one person was coming out into an ambulance. They don't know how many people are still in some of the buildings that have collapsed. They are sh not sure that some of the buildings that were four stories now look like there are two stories, two stories completely underground. They're trying to get this fire out. They still have not been able to shut off the gas, and that is the biggest problem. They're trying to find out where that is. So they're telling everybody to evacuate, get out of this area, please stay away from the marina area, and of course, don't smoke. Some people, are, I know that sounds foolish, but some people are even doing it back on the marina green. You had to tell them to stop. So that is the biggest concern, is that this fire is going to spread and there is no water. And that is the scene from here on Divisadero in the marina district. I'm in the lobby here at the Marina Middle School. It's at the corner of Chestnut and Fillmore, only about a block away from where Laura described that terrible devastation. Several hundred people, most of the Marina District residents, are getting shelter, food, clothing, warm blankets. Again, these people have pitched in to try to do everything they could to save their neighborhood and each other. Earlier, I talked to one elderly couple who said that their lives were only saved because of some young neighbors. I'm yeah, okay. Yeah, what did, how did you get out? Uh, from the, by the window. You climbed out so, the fire escape? No, yeah, no, I didn't. The people climbed for me and they brought me down. People we never knew and they never knew us, but yes. they carried us in their arms from down the, the, the stairs and they didn't leave us one minute. And even now some young folks said, 
are very, very kind of helping us to find a shelter. We can't thank them enough. Yes, but we lost knows. everything and all our places in chambers and our bodies are probably dead yeah. and we lost everything. We try to find more food and drinking water and portable toilets because the facility in this building is off and I try to find that one for giving the more secure shelter for the victims. If there is something positive in the mood here at Marina Middle School among the survivors, it is this. They helped one another. They helped one another all night long. And I'm here live at Moscone Center. This is one of those three major centers that the American Red Cross has set up as shelters for some of the people. There's been a steady stream of the stranded coming in here since about 6.30 tonight when word got out that there's food here, that there's water here, phones, and that people are safe here. A lot of people have been worried about looters on the streets or just where they should go. This is one of the places where they've come. We work over on Market Street in an older building and it seemed like a safe place to go. There's no big, huge buildings around. All the glass was crumbling on Market Street. There's no place else to go if you live in the East Bay. How do you get there? It's obvious that you're pregnant. I think condition. you got a good shot of adrenaline, that's for sure. But I'm due a week from Thursday, so it's pretty close. There's a doctor here, so it's probably a good place for me. Meanwhile, the place to be for Jay Han Han was a hospital bed in Oakland. I was on the operating table having a C-section when the earthquake hit. At first I could hear the rumbling and then the vibrations followed and I could see the light fixtures above me moving and the instruments rattling and some of the plaster falling. The doctors assured me that everything was going to be okay. It was the safest room in the hospital and sure enough, everything turned out fine and now I'm a happy parent of a little baby boy, Noah. San Jose, good news, no major damage. I think we're pretty lucky so far, and of course our heart goes out to uh, Santa Cruz and San Francisco and other places where fatalities have occurred this time, and so far I, I guess we've been a little lucky down here. The damage that we saw throughout the city was minimal. Uh, one building uh, lost a wall. It was a building that was about to fall anyway, so the damage across the city is not something to worry about. Now, even the San Francisco fire scene was looking better. This fire is coming under control. You can see the white smoke, and the fire chief tells me that when you see the white smoke, that means they've got it just about under control, but not before they had one building completely demolished. Well, right now, you're seeing uh, the end of uh, a calamity. We had uh, two, three, four, five, six buildings collapse, all different uh, stages of collapse, some severe, as you can see in the background here. Whether there are people in it, we don't know yet. Uh, there's an adage, we have uh, search and rescue teams, but we're going to wait six hours or so. If they're not dead now, with six hours they'll make it, but we have to get engineers to see that we're not going to compound uh, the hazard by sending our men in there. Mayor Art Agnos returning from a helicopter inspection of his city. Well, the city seems in reasonably good shape. Uh, the lights are out in most of the city, although the emergency light seems to be on in those areas like hospitals and those kinds of facilities. This, uh, the most serious problem we can see from the air is a tremendous traffic jam, uh, mainly in those areas trying to leave the city. We have no reports of any disorder at this time. Everybody is are being good citizens, which is uh, something we would expect to see. What is the fire in the marina? Is all right? The, the fire in the marina is under control. It's dying down right now. The biggest problem I could see from the air, as I said, is uh, tremendous traffic problems. Our fire stations are up and running. We've just put out a major fire. There are no others in the city. So things are under control. We want people to and across the bay... I'm at Jack London Square in Oakland. Jack London Square in Oakland. This was the site of a uh, A's rally earlier today. There's a big screen TV set up here. Now it's the site where people are coming off ferry boats from San Francisco. It's really the only way that they are getting from San Francisco to their homes here in the East Bay. That They're uh, going to be home safe. They're going to be home very late, but they'll be home safe tonight. We have quite a bit of damage in the downtown area, mostly some uh, rubble from older buildings and also from some new buildings as well. I think it's the AT&T building, also in downtown. It is one of the newer buildings, so this earthquake did not show any uh, favorites. Old buildings and new buildings alike were damaged throughout the downtown area. As driving through the East Bay, we were in Berkeley and in Oakland for the most part, and it was a strange sight. Uh, whole entire blocks would be out, yet one block over there would be uh, lights on, and you couldn't tell that there was ever any problem. So it's a very eerie situation. We talked to some people at, at a BART station. They did not know when the trains would be running again, other than to say it was going to be several hours before they uh, check that out. 
uh, there's any words of wisdom that we can tell you, it's please stay off the street. Let us bring you the pictures and uh, just stay out of the way because downtown is a mess. Been through the 5.4 in Livermore, about three miles for the epicenter. Seen the streets rolling like the ocean, but nothing like the one we had yesterday. That was frightening. I worked down the street down here and I just slept in the office. I couldn't get home last night because the building I live in, there's no elevator and that shut down, no water, no gas, no, you know, but I feel pretty good. It hurts. I mean, I just saw it. I was cleaning up the building and I just fixed it all nice, the displays and everything. And now everything is just shredded. It, it hurts. And the store shelves were all down and they told him it was an earthquake. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I see all the people, people that died on the Nimitz freeway and everything. I just feel sorry. My heart goes out to them. It really does. We went onto the second deck crawled in and looked around and all we could see was pinned cars. When we called out, was anybody alive? Uh, no one answered. There are very few uh, spaces that people can get to right now because of the way the freeway has collapsed on top of the vehicles. It's not looking good. I mean, there's, a, you know, we're, we're hoping that there are some spots that there's some survivors, but, uh, you know, from what we've seen as it sits right now, we've seen absolute destruction. We believe that there are, that, that it's not likely that there are any people alive still on, the, on that freeway in any of those vehicles. I'm here uh, solely to look for my son, to know if he's alive or dead. Maybe he could be in, uh, in a coma or something of a nature like that where they can't, uh, he can't respond or show any body signs but he could be still alive. Daniel Ruby's vigil would prove futile. His son Juan did not survive. With daylight and improving communication links, the quake's full geographic scope could be mapped. Of course, the freeway tragedy in Oakland, the collapse of a section of the Bay Bridge, and the havoc of the Marina District were already well known. So was the destruction in Santa Cruz. But now it was becoming apparent that damage was spread from suburban Menlo Park to Los Gatos, to Watsonville, and through the tiny communities of the Santa Cruz Mountains.
The town was hard hit, yet the pattern of damage was random and arbitrary. The interesting part is I make these for a living and didn't lose a one. Every one of them survived. We keep telling you about the widespread disaster, the large-scale devastation of this earthquake. What I'd like to do is bring it down to a more personal level, hopefully a more understandable level. This house represents 20 years of one family's life. The Fromes and family friends have made this house a home. Their $550,000 nest is demolished. They had just finished remodeling, new paint, new wallpaper, floors refinished. The good chandeliers are gone. Uh, the furniture, everything went over except the beds and the couches. Uh, everything else was on the, on the floor. The Fromes restored antiques. They salvaged what they could. They have no earthquake insurance. They do have memories. They are precious. Uh, we've done restoring of the furniture, uh, staining, and you know we put a lot of work into it besides collecting it. But we're OK. It's amazing anything or anyone survived. Look through the living room into the dining area. This is where June and Harry were sitting at 5.04 Tuesday evening. We went to the traditional doorway, which is what we've always been trained to do, where you, and you wait there for it to stop. Well, it didn't stop, and uh, so we were running down the hallway here to get out the front door and uh, couldn't walk. We were thrown down on the floor. The house actually sunk four feet. It shifted six feet off its foundation. This is just a representation of 30 other Los Gatos homes which suffered major damage. Some are worse, others not so bad. And in Watsonville... Attention, this is the Sheriff's Department. Many buildings are structurally unsound and subject to falling. You are to leave the area immediately. Please do not cross the barricades that have been put up. Without question, the people of Watsonville had been dealt a severe jolt. It shook, and I mean it shook. There was no little short thing before. It shook, and I grabbed onto the wall. I was standing in the doorway, and I grabbed onto the wall, and there's where I stayed. And I mean, I'd have fallen down had I not grabbed onto that wall. If you're not a business owner or the whole of a media press card, you do not belong in the area. Many buildings are structurally unsound and subject to falling. You are to leave the area immediately. This damaged house in which we're standing is in the Santa Cruz Mountains. We won't give you the precise location out of respect to the neighbors who complain. There have been looters in the area, and incidentally, those who complained were armed at the time and upset that anyone would take advantage of others' misfortune. We can tell you that this house is located just a few air miles from a place where Summit Road and Highway 17 intersect. Ron Frain will have an answer when someone asks, where were you in the quake of 89? Ron was in this mess when it was a house, before it became a mess on its way over the side of the hill. I heard lots of glass breaking, beams snapping. When I came out here, there was just dust falling from everywhere. I heard a propane tank up there hissing. That's the first thing I did is ran up there and turned off the gas to that. Yeah, yeah. So it was just like all on instinct. So it's like bedlam, right? Yeah. No one died on Blue Ridge in Boulder Creek. And for that, there are many who have cause to be very thankful. More than a dozen homes were totally destroyed, others less damaged. Marley Smith Merrill, like many, was uninsured. And the first thing was to find out whether we needed to get off the hill. And then if we do need to get off the hill, then I guess, oh, God. Any little shake just terrifies me. Um, then the next step will be to get it assessed, see if we actually can jack it up, and then apply for funds. Joe Force House is condemned. He says it's a wonder that he wasn't condemned himself after what he went through so near the epicenter. I was. I still don't know how I managed to get a hold of the, get onto the floor and be able to stay there for any amount of time. I've been beaten the head by so much stuff. I mean that could. It could be possible none of this no, ever happened. <laughs> when Joe and friend Phoebe collected themselves and his mother, they strapped into the seats of his pickup truck to ride out the aftershocks. It was rough on Blue Ridge outside Boulder Creek. Murphy! Murphy! Joe! Murphy's alive! He is! He is! Murphy, come here! Kitty, kitty! He's alive! <laughs> possibly know how he lived because because that window up here I flew out it most of it and Joe caught I mean, most of me and Joe caught me by the leg I've never seen anything like it, it was like the exorcist or something she was flying literally being flown from one side of the room back and forth being pounded into the wall 
Every time I'd reach up to grab her, then it'd just get me, and I'd be up there slamming. And then one time she went all the way up to the ceiling and came back again. That's when it started, like, to suck her out the window, even. I finally managed to get a grip on her, you know, and then pull her back down from there and <laughs> get her underneath me, you know, and keep her covered up. How are you coping now? Well, there's not much to cope with now. Oh, uh, well, we have, we have chainsaws and, and some dog food. Would you like a beer? <laughs> the, uh, the county emergency operations center put out a call for people who knew how to uh, knew how to handle llamas because some llamas were getting out of their pens. It sounded rather unusual. Are there a lot of llamas up here? We raise uh, alpacas and, and llamas up here. And when the earthquake hit, Tommy was outside of the corral. The corral had broken and he was outside. And How do llamas do in an earthquake? Well, he's a little jittery. I don't know how the rest of them did. He's a little jittery and a little skittish, as you can see, but uh, otherwise he's fine. From the air, Santa Cruz appeared almost untouched. It was when you got to the streets that you could judge the quake's awesome impact. The area known as the Pacific Garden Mall has sustained major damage. Official death figures range from three to more than a dozen as the result of the collapse of a downtown full of old brick buildings. But the deaths and injuries were caused by the upper floors collapsing onto shoppers and merchants on the ground level. Damage in Santa Cruz has been estimated at $350 million, and city officials say that figure is conservatively low. All major roads into or out of town were blocked by rock slides, fallen trees, or buckled pavement. And at St. Joseph's Seminary in Menlo Park. The, um, the older wings, uh, dating from 1926, are very badly, uh, very badly damaged. Among the students and uh, faculty, and there were no injuries. Um, when the tower collapsed, uh, a landmark that's visible, used to be visible from 280, uh, there was a workman on that tower who came down with it and uh, was taken to El Camino and died there. While devastation in the surrounding region was just being reported, the problems of the marina were perhaps too widely known. At some points today, they had tour buses coming into this area with 1,500 people just gawking, wanting to see the damage. That has gotten in the way of the emergency vehicles that are trying to get out here and trying to, to get this district back into shape. Some of them are just tourists coming into the marina. That's what the police officers couldn't believe. We saw people standing in front of some of the devastation, taking pictures, smiling. I don't think they understand the magnitude of what has gone on here. I just, I don't believe it, honey, what's happened to him. From citizens of the marina, many kinds of human reactions. It's just, I don't, it's Skip and uh, Phyllis just got out of there. I just can't believe I can't. It. And I can't I, believe I, her father got out on the second he, floor. He was, otherwise, he would have been gone because he's home. I was downtown in the financial district, but my fiancé was home, and he was walking down the steps, and he made it to the middle of the street and literally saw the building come down in front of him. Um, I'm just glad we're alive, but there's nothing there. Everything's gone. I have a little baby about nine days old, and they're at the top floor of the house on the left, and uh, I just feel very fortunate they have out now that I see it today, you know, I got a second grief, I guess, just to figure out what the hell is going to happen now. That's, I'm sure everybody feels the same way. Uh, filling up the toilets so I can flush them. What kind of shape is your house in? Actually, mine got very little damage. Um, it just got worse as you went down the block. So, as a matter of fact, uh, except for some of the china in the dining room, none of my dishes broke or really nothing, nothing was out of place. I'm more than thankful. It's uh, a blessing that uh, the whole block didn't burn down last night, actually. I just saw the chandelier shaking, and I was just thrust forward towards my front bay window. And I didn't realize I was at ground level. I thought I was still up on the third floor, but I, I looked out the window, and there were bikers there, and he helped me out. And there were two people trapped underneath me, and I could hear them screaming. And he went and got... Um, some firemen to come and get them out, and they had to saw a hole in the floor to pull them out, but they were alive. I don't know what, to, what I'm going to be doing, what, what's going to happen next. Uh, all my memories are there. Everything I had was in that building. And when I started seeing the wall split apart, I, I knew it was the big one. And I just everything just came crashing down. I tried to get out the door, and as I did, I saw this door 
this stair flip up and then I just saw the sidewalks open up and then I look and there was just a cloud of dust and this place had already gone over in a matter of 15 seconds. That whole apartment building was gone. And then I watched a man from the third story climb out that window right there. He rode it all the way down. Two additional notes to that first morning in San Francisco's Marina District. Vice President Dan Quayle made a brief tour of the ruins. And an enterprising t-shirt salesman had already set up a sidewalk display and was open for business. Those of us that survived, we wanted to have something to take back home. I'm going back to Connecticut, he's going back to Okinawa. We want to have something to commemorate the earthquake. We've all seen the horrors of what happened in the Marina District and the collapse of the freeway over in the East Bay, but other areas have been hit too, perhaps not as hard. But this, for example, is what's happening in the Richmond District of San Francisco. This large building has been declared unsafe. You can see the destruction that happened as a result of that earthquake the other day. This is just typical of what we found out here. Other buildings maybe not declared unsafe yet, but as you drive along the streets, along California Street, Clement Street, and out in the avenues, you can see places that are all cracked and broken along the bottoms of the houses. We talked to a group of people who live in the Richmond district and they were taking a very philosophical view of what happened. The first thing I thought of was how lucky I was because so many people were crashed, like when the freeways fell. And I, just things like, I was like, I was, all the things we took for granted, I realized. I love San Francisco. Um, it can shake, rattle and roll as long as it wants to. I'm not gonna move out. Uh, just as long as family and friends and the city can get back together, I'd never leave here. Well, I've just noticed that people have been a lot kinder to each other the past couple of days, and uh, unfortunately that probably won't uh, continue, but I wish it would. What you found out is who you could count on and who you couldn't when the quake happened, because I was in a high-rise building in the financial district. Some of the people banded together and helped each other. Others just scattered and went their own way and were only concerned with themselves. So you found out very quickly who you can count on and who you can't. Every place that we were, people that were at my house were calling, they could see everything and we're listening to the radio. And next time we're having a battery powered <laughs> television set so we can see it too. And this is what we've been finding in some of these big apartment houses here in the Richmond. Uh, obviously it says unsafe, do not enter or occupy. Comment, structure leaning noticeably, evidence of some extent of foundation failure. This is the kind of thing that people can have to deal with for a long time. The city came around and uh, he posted it and we asked him what that meant if we could enter. He said at your own risk, but he wouldn't spend the night, he said. There is scattered evidence of destruction all around Oakland. Owners of the Ebony Plaza Hotel removed signs that dangled precariously, but it wasn't enough to inspire confidence in residents that the hotel is safe. Look at it, it's down at the bottom and looks like it could cave in at any time. I just don't feel safe. I didn't feel safe when I came here. It's just that this is some just temporarily for me so I can get something better. Damage was particularly acute in the downtown area. Some of it is obvious, like the fallen bricks at the Old Swan's Market at 10th and Clay, or the Emporium Capwell building on Telegraph. Other buildings required a closer look, like the 1420 Broadway building across from City Hall. Its facade cracked in patterns that signal its demise. Oakland City Hall is closed for at least two months. City Hall West, however, might be closed forever. Inside are offices tossed around like they were in a blender, walls deeply cracked, and a stairway barely visible through a window that completely collapsed. PG&E crews were busy removing the gas line in front of Marjorie Anderson's house at 11th and Cypress so the house can be torn down. She's lived there since 1948. Once it stopped, we got out. But we couldn't get out the front door because it was blocked. And the neighbors were out there hauling, and, and we, they pushed the door in so we could get out and lift us out over the roof. We didn't know the roof had crumbled in. 84-year-old Mahalia C. Williams isn't sure about the fate of her West Oakland home of more than 30 years. She's just glad to have survived. I just thank God that I was blessed. I said, save me. I said, Lord, have mercy. Save me, save me. And I felt, you know, I felt happy and glad, you know, it came on out. I didn't get excited. I just thank God that he saved me. About 150 residents of the Dalziel Hotel need a new home. Dorothy Williams was one of those evacuated during the quake who returned to reclaim belongings. But property wasn't her biggest concern. 
The third and the fourth window up there is where my apartment, and my cat's still up there. She's my friend the, is up there out. trying to find her. I, yeah! I'm coming! Gary will be up to help you, honey. I couldn't find her when I tried to come down, uh, when they evacuated us. I've been, oh, I've been, who oh, now I can eat. I haven't been able to eat anything. Oh, thank God. Oh, that's the best news I had today. <laughs> An amazing sight of a massive Navy helicopter lifting a uh, heavy-duty backhoe heavy machine, lifting it and twirling it around in the air as if it were a toy. Okay, that is going to be used later on in this operation to clear away some debris. Obviously, they feel strong enough about the uh, support of the freeway that they were able to drop this backhoe onto the top level of the freeway. Heavy equipment began rolling in before dawn and continued throughout the day. Many of the trucks, bulldozers, and backhoes were brought in by volunteers. Others helped in other ways. Billy Kelly spent the night squeezing through the rubble, looking for survivors. You could hear voices, you could hear voices screaming, help me, help me, help me, until the fire just started. Then you don't hear them no more. Rescue teams are trying to keep their hopes up, but they aren't optimistic, and it's easy to see why. The upper deck of the Nimitz gave way and flattened dozens of cars for almost a mile. The driver of the Chevron truck stopped just in time. It's a slow, difficult job and one that will take days and weeks. What they are going to plan to do throughout the evening now is to separate the top and bottom levers, uh, levels of the freeway. They are going to put in massive beams to support the top level and separate it from the bottom level. They will then fly in by helicopter a huge cutting device that will then cut the top layer of the concrete. They'll pull that out, bring the cars out, and bring them down to the ground. Most traffic lights were still out, but much of the city was getting back to normal when San Francisco's Mayor Agnos made a summary report. In general, we are in excellent shape considering what we've been through in the last 24 hours, and uh, the city is returning to normal in virtually every sphere of functioning for the city. Crime was extraordinarily low. People responded by caring for one another rather than doing damage throughout this. On an average night in San Francisco, there are 100 arrests. Last night, there were 25. The public health department has told me that there were about 100 casualties that were brought to the hospital. They handled them easily. About 25 of them were serious and were handled as well. The library has been closed because it is structurally unsafe at this time, pending further review. The main library uh, there are over a quarter of a million books on the floor. We're going to need some help and we'll be calling on volunteers once the building is safe to uh, help us restore uh, it into working order. The Academy of Sciences uh, came through pretty well. None of the animals or fish were hurt. However, the, uh, it does need considerable cleanup and will be closed until uh, Sunday. The Asian Art Museum lost uh, an estimated 10 to 15 million dollars worth of art. Uh, that, were, well, that was damaged. However, that is insured. Uh, that's only uh, a, a rather pyrrhic victory because uh, obviously we can't replace the art even though the insurance pays for it. But there was a long night ahead in the blacked out marina district. It's a lot of people, a lot of tension, a lot of nervous energy and people just pulling together. People came to us for coffee and tea and when we didn't have enough they asked if they could help out, so it's everybody just kind of banding together. It's unbelievable. It's just amazing. And there's food lines going and housing going and seniors on this end and people just coming from their homes wanting to volunteer like we did. Uh, we have a lot of people from Fillmore to Baker and from Francisco down to the uh, Marina Boulevard, elderly people that uh, are, are still in their buildings. They don't know what's going on. 80s and 90 year olds. And if they need medical assistance, they got to try to contact the Red Cross. We got crews going out in the street with, uh, with uh, bullhorns trying to contact them. You know how many we got out? How many? I'd say about uh, 10 tonight about 30 today in the afternoon. They didn't even know that, you know, that they, there were, might be danger. The buildings are all structurally unsound on the bottom. I mean, I'm not an engineer, but we try to get out as many people as possible. 
and a lot of Italian, I speak Italian, so there's a lot of Italian speaking people out there that don't understand the English. So we need to announce it. If maybe in a couple of languages it would be a good idea. You have a place to stay? We're staying here. Yeah, they've been really great too. This is really an incredible effort. They went from nothing, a school here, to, to feeding people gourmet food practically. I mean, if you need a bottle of milk or you need a, a place to sleep or whatever, you just want to go home, but you know. Tonight's a whole different night than last night. Describe to me the feeling out here. It seems a lot eerier. I don't know what it is. To me, it, uh, it uh, kind of brings home uh, the earthquake, uh, the bodies finally being brought out, uh, the, the long search for them. The department actually knew the, the location of the bodies and was able to, uh, to, uh, to see the victims, but we couldn't reach them because of the hazardous condition in the building. So the decision was to knock it down and, uh, and chart the location of the victims and then go after them with heavy equipment and, uh, and manpower. We provided banks of public telephones for the use of the homeless and we uh, made those phones available free of charge on local and long distance calls. Each click represents the beginning or end of a phone call, 80 million of which have been placed or received in the Greater Bay Area between the time of the quake and midnight last night, two to three times the normal volume. Some of those calls were processed more slowly than usual, but Pac Bell contends that no persistent caller failed to make connection. A lot of people aren't used to waiting for a dial tone, and so they put down the receiver and try again. If you'd just wait a few more seconds, eventually you would get the dial tone. The other thing you would have experienced is that uh, there would have been a delay maybe in getting a call completed. You would have heard a busy circuit condition. Bah, 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 bah. But if you tried again maybe a second time or perhaps a third, you'd get through. Planning worked. There are 160 buildings around the Bay Area in which phone calls are processed. Each is equipped with emergency power facilities. Batteries, wired in series, provide the central San Francisco switching facility with four to five hours of power. A jet engine cranks out 30,000 kilowatts. It kicked in when PG&E service was interrupted, none of which would have made a particle of difference if equipment inside had been disabled. Everything in each of the operation buildings is strapped down, floor and ceiling. If the building stands, the equipment stands. Services such as fax systems, portable phones and beepers were dysfunctional from time to time and area to area, but not because the on-land telephone component of those systems failed. Another way of seeing what happened, a readout of long-distance calls from across the nation right after the quake, a record five million to the Bay Area in the first hour alone. Many were between concerned relatives, friends, business associates. Others were from news media, sending words and pictures to a world intensely fascinated by America's first primetime earthquake. <laughs> Ancora piena emergenza, San Francisco. San Francisco di 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 San Francisco San Francisco di 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 San Soon to be followed by TV anchors and star personalities from a dozen countries. Que también se busca reparar y retirar las moles de concreto que sean. In some cases, it seemed, the further away the audience, the more devastating the reports. To some overseas television viewers, it must have seemed that all of Northern California was in ruins, its cities totally devastated, the entire population dead or maimed. As the casualty figures rise into the hundreds, it's obvious many of the victims won't be found for days. This is the human face of an earthquake.
television with big lights and sometimes big stars strode in with high profile, thus claiming perhaps more than its share of both compliments and criticism. But print journalism deserves its measure of each, and no matter where you lived in the world, your daily paper was running its biggest headlines over a San Francisco dateline. The coverage was as varied as the headlines, the writing as differing as the readership. The Chronicle and Examiner had a couple of thin days with their main presses out of commission, but none of the local dailies missed an edition. By the time the slick magazines hit newsstands, only the most remote jungle tribesmen could have been unaware that Northern California had faced catastrophe and survived. Caltrans crews are working on both levels of the bridge, trying to figure out the best way to remove the upper roadbed, which collapsed onto the lower deck. This will not be an easy task. This section of roadbed weighs about 250 tons. Workmen will have to separate it from the bridge and then lift it out of the way and onto a barge in the middle of San Francisco Bay. Here on the upper deck, crews are busy trying to lash the collapsed section of the deck onto the secure portion of the upper roadway in a way to keep it from falling further in case there are any aftershocks. It appears the high-rise section of the bridge moved horizontally or sideways. The massive column that supports the collapsed section moved easterly by about six inches, shearing off five-inch diameter bolts on two of the legs. There is now a possibility some of the other support columns to the east also may have suffered stress or damage. With a major artery between San Francisco and the East Bay severed, massive traffic jams were predicted. But the first couple of mornings held some surprises as reporters were called in live from major checkpoints. We are at the San Mateo Bridge, and as you can see behind me, traffic is very heavy heading westbound into San Francisco. I talked to some of the people at the Toll Plaza Administration Building, and they told me that they thought traffic was twice as heavy as usual. Up until a few minutes ago, I was prepared to tell you that traffic was uh, running fairly smoothly here on the Dumbarton. Obviously, that's not the case anymore, and as you can imagine, beyond the toll gate, which is a couple of thousand yards behind me, there must be a uh, terrific backup. Expect heavy, heavy traffic. We already have it on southbound 880, leading through the Oakland area, down all the way to the San Mateo Bridge, Highway 92. There's just no way to avoid that. And as we discussed before, the aerial view that we've been uh, getting of the city indicates uh, much is resembling getting back to normal anyway. Uh, much of the power is on, traffic is moving, but one thing that isn't back to normal and glares out at you as something that is definitely a product of this earthquake is that uh, 280 is still closed. As you can see by the clock on the uh, toll plaza, it's reading 729. That makes it officially the apex or the height of the morning rush, the morning commute, and it is so far a piece of cake. Things are going so smoothly here, it's eerie. This is about the time I usually come through, and I can tell you this is not what it's usually like. And it is a very good morning here at the Lafayette BART station. I can tell you that this subway system is, if anything, uncrowded this morning. There are probably fewer people than normal riding BART, and that means that if you've got to go into San Francisco, if you've got to go to work, or if you've got to conduct business, BART is definitely the way to go. But on morning two, the East Bay Freeway was stopped dead at Berkeley. The Hawkins Company has been in business making signs for the past 41 years. They were in the process of repairing damage from Tuesday's massive earthquake when this happened. The fire was started by a welder repairing quake damage. Ironically, the company was making emergency signs for the earthquake aftermath. Closed freeways and the collapsed bridge section brought a boom to two commuting alternatives. Bay Area Rapid Transit, BART, had been crippled briefly by power failures, then closed for a safety inspection of its Transbay tube. But now, people who had at first been hesitant to venture into its tunnels were boarding BART trains in record numbers. An improvised armada of ferry boats was fanning out across the bay. A fleet of sightseeing and party boats were pressed into service to augment the existing Marin ferries. And more craft were brought in from Seattle, San Diego, and Catalina Island.
the Postal Service had to do some improvising, too, with what may have been the shortest airmail route in history. Rain and sleet may not keep the mail from getting through, but a major quake, that's another thing altogether. You might not have known this, but Oakland's mail and the rest of Northern California's has to come here first to the San Francisco facility for processing, and then it's distributed to the various cities. Well, with the Bay Bridge closed, getting the mail to the East Bay is not going to be as simple as it once was. Starting today, the Army National Guard has been pressed into service. Military helicopters will take up the slack for mail trucks, delayed by detours and closings. Because of the tremendous problems they're having with transportation over here and the vital nature of the U.S. mail, uh, it was determined that we were, we had the capability and we were available to do this mission. The choppers used to transport troops and cargo will now haul 10,000 pounds of high-priority mail on each flight from San Francisco to Oakland and back. Federal emergency management officials asked the National Guard to help out. The Postal Service is also considering turning to BART or ferry boats, whatever it takes to get mail delivery back on track. Even with few cars on San Francisco streets driving without traffic signals proved tricky, that brought out an unexpected and welcomed phenomenon. Drivers were unaccustomedly civil and considerate of one another. But for days, the tension would be obvious. It found its relief in many ways. For some, it was a matter of looking. Others found relief in talking. I didn't believe it was going to happen until the year 2000. I could say, oh, not going to happen. Not now, not now. By 2000, I'm too old anyhow. So then, well, what happened? So you got to die somewhere. As often as not, the tension broke with unexpected tears. In the rubble of the Santa Cruz Mall, survivors had been found, but as night fell and aftershocks continued, the ruins had become too unstable for further search, and reluctantly, officials closed off the site. What used to be the ceiling and the walls is now the floor. Uh, they dug as much as they could. Uh, we used search and rescue dogs to ascertain if there was any type of life they could detect in there. We've done it three or four times all day, and we've used four different dogs. Uh, none of the dogs could, to, could give any sign that there was any sign of life uh, at the bottom of that pile. Yet, the next day, the friends of one missing woman were still holding out hope. And then... You're looking at a picture of the Santa Cruz County coroner's van, and when it arrived, Don, it confirmed everyone's worst fears here, and that is that the young woman who has been trapped for two days inside one of the buildings at Pacific Garden Mall has been found, has been found dead. Behind me now, S Santa Cruz Mayor Marty weren't wer Wernham is giving a press conference of sorts. She's uh, telling everyone, members of the press here, that indeed Robin Ortiz has been found. She's been found dead. She's saying this is a terrible tragedy. Behind me, you see some of the uh, dead woman's friends. They've been here for two days. They're comforting one another. Uh, some of the crowd here was yelling, tell us what's happening, not the press. That's been kind of the attitude. But the mayor feels that this is the best way to get the word out. The police and rescue people had been heavily criticized throughout this search for not continuing after dark, but as we reported to you last night, this was a very, very dangerous situation. These people are beside themselves. One woman has fainted in the crowd. Can you see this? They're being taken away. It's a very emotional scene here in Santa Cruz. People are quite distraught. We've been here for two days, and I feel as if I know this woman. Robin Ortiz is the latest victim of the earthquake. In San Francisco, emotional frustration for a different reason. Hundreds were waiting to hear if their buildings would be torn down. I can't get, I can't get to my house. I can't find out anything. I can't, I, I don't know. It's right there. Oh, it's right there, and I have no idea whether or not they determine if my building is is one that has to come down. This whole street is pretty much devastated. These guys won't let me even pass the gate, and that's what's frustrating. I mean, we've slept on the floor on the, in the street last night, and, you know, it's it's kind of a, it's frustrating. You can see that the building's not safe to inhabit. It's uh, collapsed on the first floor, but if I could have 15 minutes just to take out the most my most personal belongings, I don't want to carry out a TV. I just want to get letters and stuff, pictures and stuff like that. But. I think the chances of that are probably slim. It would turn out, eventually, that exact solution was allowed to some 15 minutes at your own risk. These people are trying to salvage at least something. They have 15 minutes to get all they can. 
Throwing it out the four-story window is the easiest way. So if, uh, if it doesn't survive the fall, that's better than uh, sitting in there and being buried and losing it forever. What was the most important stuff to you then? Well, the documents. Oh, and, yeah, and IRS information and bank books and checkbooks. We, let, we don't carry checkbooks with us. We had nothing to write checks on. Oh, I'd go back for everything, but I wanted to get out first. It was so terrible. Both of these women, now homeless, are living with a person they met just days ago. But these two ladies are with me, and we're just doing the best we can. Thank goodness I can do something. We're just muddling through. Aren't we're muddling we? through, and they're gallant. They're really gallant. You know, I haven't seen a tear. If we we're going to have any kind of luck at all, it seems like we might have this kind. And I guess if we didn't have bad luck, we wouldn't have any luck. People must take their belongings out on foot because the marina's closed off to cars. But one man's coordinating a U-Haul pickup along Marina Boulevard for anyone who needs it. If you want to uh, try to bring your stuff out this, uh, this intersection here, and then I can uh, uh, just pull the truck up and, uh, and load it up. Buildings are shifting in the marina day by day, sometimes hourly. Yesterday, you could see this white building's door, and the one next to it, you could see the garages. But they've both fallen down one entire level. These are the anxious faces of the people who live in those two buildings. They want to get in to save at least something, but they won't be able to. A lot different once you're in there than looking from it from out here. Is this yours? It was one of my Check this, Bill. <laughs> it came out of her apartment and landed in the car. Fantastic! It was in the window and it did it right. <laughs> yeah, I'm so emotional over a piece of stained glass. You get the feeling as you watch people reclaim small items they thought they had lost forever that those small things take on greater meaning when the big things have been shattered. And they were able to do that in this building because of the fellow sitting in the cab of that big piece of equipment, he has operated the thing like a surgical instrument. He's Mike Fitzgerald. Well, they told me to be careful, yeah. so I'm being careful. You know, it means a lot to these people who are I standing there watching. I know, and I've ended up talking with a lot of them and stuff, and you know, all the people are standing there crying and stuff, I start feeling bad for them. On something like this, I just look at the structure, the structure of the building and try to take it apart, like wall by wall, look at it and go, well, okay, well, if I lift this up, then that'll work, and, you know, just mechanically. They all watched Carl Sanders, Bill Logan, and Kim Bruninga, Helene Warwick, and other residents at what was once the apartment building at 2100 North Point in the Marina. Theirs has been a year-long week since the quake. They had made a run at hiring their own heavy equipment company to come in and dismantle the building carefully so that they could rescue some of their belongings. Helene, are these your pictures? But the cost was to prove too high, and there was some question of whether their heavy equipment operator would be able to do any better job than Mike Fitzgerald would do. So, after grappling with City Hall, they simply implored the Department of Public Works to be as gentle as possible. Yeah, real jackpot. I'm glad. All there. I'm really glad. A little antique thing, the whole yeah, bit. Right. The dishes are clean. Well, you know, they were. Uh, but what can I do with part of a set of dishes, you know? Carl, you go down in history. <laughs> no. I won't. Yeah. carried away with joy. And at a dump site near San Jose. It certainly doesn't look like a treasure trove, this twisted, tortured pile of earthquake rubble from San Francisco's Marina District. But this tangled junk heap is formed from the walls, the roofs, the furniture, and the knickknacks that the quake toppled and bulldozers finished off in a sort of post-earthquake coup de grace. Professional scavengers, perfect strangers who never knew the Marina residents, comb through 2,800 cubic yards of debris that's trucked in every day under the watchful eye of a security guard. The culls, the identifiable items, are stored in a trailer where they're sorted and bagged by their Marina District address. Some of the salvaged material is priceless. Water skiing pictures. Baby pictures. Who knows what this snapshot means to its owner? Memories are like that. They're very personal. It's, uh, it's really depressing for us. Um, we understand this is all everyone's prized possessions, their memories, their lives. 
Uh, we try to get as much material out as possible. Uh, we're just hoping uh, we could find everything for everybody. The collection process will take at least a couple of weeks. Then the earthquake surviving artifacts will be trucked to San Francisco so their owners can reclaim them. And here's an address book. It apparently belonged to somebody with the initials of DT. And inside is a party invitation. An invitation to a surprise birthday party on Friday, December 4th. We won't tell you who the party's for because that would ruin the surprise. But DT, this address book is waiting for you. On the third morning after the quake, workers on the Bay Bridge were buzzed by a couple of helicopters, and in one, they saw a familiar face. President Bush spent most of the day visiting the hardest hit sections of Oakland, San Francisco, and Santa Cruz. Well, I, I'm deeply moved by this, deeply moved by it. Sad in some ways, and yet uh, genuine appreciation for the way this community is pulling together, this state. So there's this human dimension that's brought home much more clearly by, by coming here. There's no ceiling on the compassion of the American people, and that's the point. And when you look at private efforts, just in what we've seen today, neighbor helps neighbor, friend helps friend. People reaches across and tries to lift up those that are hurt, and so I, I I don't know how you put a price tag on it, but that is the American way. Near the epicenter in the Santa Cruz Mountains, large cracks showed geologists that the Earth had moved not just horizontally, but vertically as well, something scientists had not expected. And the Earth continued to move, with hundreds of aftershocks registering on the Geodesic Survey's readout. Some felt while reporters were on the air. A 7.5 earthquake. You feel that? I sure as heck did. 4.4. That's a pretty good shaker. That's a good shaker. That's uh, one of the stronger ones we felt. We just had another after shot. You hear windows crack. You hear building shake. Obviously, we've just had an aftershock of considerable strength here in the studio, and I'm sure you felt that in other places compared to uh, the aftershocks in earlier days. I think a bit stronger this time, though, hard to tell. Aftershocks made it especially dangerous for workers on the collapsed freeway. For more than 60 hours, they had recovered only bodies, and then a rumor someone in there was still alive. That is not a well-lighted area. It was still very dark up there. Okay? The person may have just seen a shadow moving that may, may have caused an appearance of a body movement. But it was no rumor. He's coherent, he's waving, he's hollering to get him out. And the first thing he said was, thank God, I'm alive. We've always uh, kept hope. Uh, when the president came, that really lifted our spirits. And I believe that motivated some men to go up there and give it one more try. Over four days, 57-year-old longshoreman Buck Helms had been entombed beneath tons of concrete and rubble. Everybody was very professional. We got the man out as quickly as possible. We were pulling this man out, he could drop a pin. It was total silence. When he came out, you should have heard those cheers. His friends would say, Buck Helms was too tough to die. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Greatest rescue ever been involved in, man. It's fabulous. It just makes it all worthwhile. All right. It's all worthwhile. Ten days after the quake of 89, Candlestick Park was again filled to capacity. Hi again, everyone. I'm Al Michaels. 
At this very moment, 10 days ago, we began our telecast with an aerial view of San Francisco, always a spectacular sight, and particularly so on that day because the cloudless sky of October 17th was ice blue and the reflections of the late day sun sparkled like a thousand jewels. Then, of course, that feeling of pure radiance was transformed into horror and grief and despair in 15 seconds. And now, on October 27th, like a fighter who's taken a vicious blow to the stomach and has groggily arisen, this region moves on and moves ahead. And one part of that scenario is the resumption of the World Series. No one in this ballpark tonight, no player, no vendor, no fan, no writer, no announcer, in fact, no one in this area, period, can forget the images, the column of smoke in the marina, the severed bridge, the grotesque tangle of concrete in Oakland. The pictures are embedded in our minds. And while the mourning and the agonizing and the after effects continue, in about 30 minutes, the plate umpire, Vic Voltaggio, will say, play ball. And the players will play, the vendors will sell, the crowd will exhort, the announcers will announce. And for many of the six million people in this region, it will be like revisiting fantasy land. But fantasy land is where baseball comes from anyway. And maybe right about now, that's the perfect place for a three hour rest. The experience was unique. The moment unlikely to occur at a baseball game. Thousands sang with relief, gratitude, passionate pride in a city and a region. Thank you. 